Welcome back to asymptotics and perturbation methods. We're still talking about the WKB method of perturbation theory. And um, so after our introductory lecture, where we looked at a case where uh, there were, in the jargon, no turning points in the problem. Today, I want to discuss the more difficult case when there are turning points. And we'll see some interesting um, phenomena that arise, a new kind of matching that we have to deal with. And it'll be our first taste of special functions called airy functions. I think we talked about them earlier in the course without really saying where they come up scientifically. But today, we'll actually really see them in their natural setting. They, they are very um, wedded and tied into these turning point issues that come up in WKB. All right, so let us get rolling. <clears throat> So I've written out a lot of stuff at the end of the lecture, but not at the beginning. Um, so here we go. So th this you can read about in Bender and Orsag um, in section 10.4. And so I want to focus today on the particular class of equations that we mentioned last time called Schrodinger equations. Um, so they're going to look like this. Consider a second order equation of this form, epsilon squared y double prime equals some function q of x times y. As usual, we're thinking of epsilon as positive, but very small. And in the quantum case, this would be, uh, epsilon would be proportional to Planck's constant. And it arises in the Schrodinger equation as epsilon squared. So um, that's what we've got here. So as I say, this is a, a kind of Schrodinger equation. Um, not the Schrodinger equation, because that should have an energy in it, as well as a function that's a potential. This Q is sort of like E minus the potential V of X or something like that, but, um, or maybe the negative of that. But anyway, the, the key point for us today is that there's two types of behavior. We mentioned this last time, that in regions where Q is negative, um, the equation, roughly speaking, has the character of something like a simple harmonic oscillator, except that Q, which would play the role of the spring constant, can depend on position X. So you're going to get something that's oscillatory. Um, you'll have oscillatory solutions for Y. Whereas in regions where Q is positive, there will be exponential growth and decay. Um, as possible solutions, roughly speaking. Uh, and so a turning point is a point that separates those two types of behavior. So um, a point where Q of X is zero is called a turning point. And so the reason I think for this name um, is in classical mechanics, we often talk about a problem of this type. You have a, a potential well. Um, so there's some function V of X and then there's some constant energy level, let's say like this. And, you know, there's some coordinates that that's this x-axis, and you've got a, a particle that's classically confined to live in this potential well. It's, it's um, 
you know, like you'd have this, I'm kind of going off script here, but I'll just continue. Um, classical conservation of energy, if I don't have any friction, would say something like this, right? The kinetic energy plus the potential energy would equal the total energy. And so in the classical problem of a particle confined to a potential well, this particle can kind of dance around. It can, you know, if you gave it some energy, some kinetic energy, it could roll up to here, then roll back down, then roll up to there, roll back down. And so these points um, where E equals V are the turning points. Right, that's a turning point in the sense that the particle turns around in its motion. It goes from rolling uphill to rolling downhill. And so in our problem, the Q plays the role, as I said, of it's proportional to E minus V. So, so I think that's where the language comes from. It's from thinking about classical physics. But now we're thinking here about quantum mechanics, kind of. And in the quantum description, what you would have is this wave function which is sort of what Y is doing here, normally it would be called psi. Um, and this wave function, we're gonna see in these kinds of problems, we'll have oscillatory behavior inside in the classically permissible region. I don't really know how to draw it. I mean, qualitatively, it'd be sort of like something oscillating like this. And then when it gets to a turning point, it's going to then decay exponentially. And that's because, you know, classically, it would be impossible for the particle to be anywhere except in here. This is the allowed region, classically. But the, um, the region on the outside is the forbidden region. And yet in quantum theory, there is some probability of a particle getting out here where classically it wouldn't be possible. And so the exponential decay that we're gonna see in these um, solutions that we're talking about when I mentioned this exponential growth or decay, this kind of exponential decay is associated with the classical impossibility of being out there. There's very little probability of such a thing happening exceedingly small in most circumstances. Although tunneling is a real thing. It's, it's related to radioactivity, for instance. I mean, we need tunneling to, to have the, uh, well, all kinds of nuclear processes and stuff. Okay, anyway, none of that was in my notes, so I probably garbled it totally with what I just said, winging it. But, but anyway, let me get back to the main point, um, which was I wanna start talking about this kind of behavior about what happens when I make this transition from oscillatory to exponential decay. That's the turning point issue that we're interested in. Okay, so as I say, a point X zero where Q is zero is called a turning point. And um, the simple WKB that we discussed in the last lecture doesn't work near such a point. So that breaks down. Near such an X zero. And so we need to remedy that. Um, and what we're going to do is we need to do some kind of matching argument. Um, do matching near the turning point using an inner layer to match the oscillatory and the exponentially decaying solutions. And that's where the airy functions will come in. They're transition functions that can do both oscillatory and exponentially decaying behavior. Using airy functions. Okay, so that's the general setup for what we have planned. Um, you wanna ask anything at this point before I start diving in? Okay. So let us, re let me do a specific example then. The book um, in Bender and Orsog, they, they sort of do the general case, but I'm gonna just do one example for the whole lecture. 
which is, um, let's choose a specific function for V or for Q. Uh, I'll choose it to be cinch of X cosh squared of X. So that's my Q. This is an example mentioned in the book. Um, and it has some nice exact, uh, and there's some things we can do with it that are very convenient. So that's why we've chosen this particular Q. There's a question of boundary conditions. Um, Bender and Orsog use the boundary conditions. They say choose Y of zero is one. And let's impose that Y goes to zero as X goes to positive infinity. Um, another kind of boundary condition we could use, the one that would be more common in quantum theory would be um, to say that the condition is that, that this wave function has to be square integrable so that it can help you define a good um, probability density on the whole space. So what this means is you would assume here that the integral of y squared dx from minus infinity to infinity is finite. Which kind of functions like boundary conditions too, in that it's giving you this global condition on y, including out at plus and minus infinity. So anyway, we're not going to focus too much on the boundary conditions. Let's just think about trying to solve this differential equation um, with WKB. One thing I guess I should say first, though, is what does this function Q of X look like? If we draw a picture of cinch times cosh squared, this is what it looks like qualitatively. So cinch, remember, is an odd function that grows exponentially. And for that matter, cosh is even, and it grows exponentially. So you're going to get something that looks about like this. Uh, I mean, it's really going up quickly. And then down. So this is my Q of X. And so you can see this particle, like if you think of this as a potential well, the particle doesn't wanna be out there at large X. It looks pretty content to roll down to back to negative X. And so the expected shape of the Y, based on what I said, that in regions where Q is negative, we expect oscillatory behavior. Um, we're kind of guessing that our solution will look sort of like this. Uh, something that should sort of decay over here and then maybe oscillate somehow over there. And then some kind of a layer or something that's gonna connect them near the turning point, which is in this problem, um, x equals zero. Okay, so let's start writing down our WKB. So last time we wrote down this formula. We showed that the first order approximation in the WKB method is that the solution Y of X is asymptotic to one over Q of X to the one quarter power and then um, C1 exponential of one over epsilon indefinite integral of square root of Q of T dt. And 
And then there's another term that looks like that, except it's got a negative sign in front of it. So minus one over epsilon dot, dot, dot. Well, I'll just write it out. Square root Q of T dt. And then um, that's the end of it. And then there's order epsilon correction terms to all that stuff. But so that's the WKB approximation in regions where Q has one sign. So that's valid in regions where Q is not zero. And now in our problem um, here, the Q is this conveniently chosen function. Um, well, let's see, it's cinch of X cosh squared of X. Now, why is that a convenient function? So for one thing, I mean, this doesn't really, it's because when I take that integral of the square root, things are gonna come out nicely. I'll be able to do the integral. That's why. It's a, just a contrived example so we can write some things down explicitly. So like the one quarter power of this will be one quarter power like that. Um, square root of Q of T appearing inside the integral will be um, cinch of t to the one half power times cosh of t. And so let me consider the two different halves of the problem. Let's first look at where x is positive. So we're working on the right side. Okay, so over there, if I write down this indefinite integral, I'll go, let's say from zero to X, um, this integral that appears, I'm referring to, in the WKB, this integral right here. Let me just write that out for my specific Q. That integral I mean, you see, this is why I inserted the, the cosh. So I have a chain rule term. And so I can just write down this integral to be um, two thirds cinch of t to the three halves power, t running from zero to x. So I just get this nice looking expression, two thirds cinch of x to the three halves. So that's my square root of my, um, my integral of q of t square root. And so um, this tells me that I can write my y of x in the WKB a little more explicitly as one over cinch of x cosh squared of x, that's all to the one quarter power And then C1 exp one over epsilon two thirds cinch of X to the three halves plus a similar term C2 exp of the same thing, but with a negative one over epsilon two thirds. Cinch X to the three halves. I mean, notice what a weird uh, 
expression that is. You've got an exponential with a cinch up in the exponent. We are really getting exponential up there, right? I mean, it's an exponential of an exponential. And, and for good measure, we've got a one over epsilon in there as well, where epsilon is small. Um, so <laughs> as X goes to positive infinity, remember we're thinking about the right side at the moment. So what's going on out at plus infinity? As X goes to plus infinity, and remember Bender and Orsag want the boundary condition to be Y going to zero out there at plus infinity. That's this picture. Right, I mean, I, I want my y to be small out here at infinity, or, or actually in this picture, I want this to be, you know, like decaying out here. So one of these two solutions is not gonna work. It's this one, the one that has a positive argument of the exponential. This is exponentially big in here, and then you're doing exponential of something exponentially big. This term is gigantic. That cannot be tolerated. C1 has to be zero in order to satisfy the boundary condition at infinity. So I'll just remind you that cinch of X and cosh of X are both, you know, they're asymptotic to E to the X over two. As X goes to infinity. So, um, the term that's the plus one over epsilon term. is really enormous. And to satisfy the boundary conditions, we're gonna need C1 equals zero. Okay, so I've gotten rid of that. And so my term on the right, the, the WKB prediction on the right is that Y right of X is asymptotic to some constant. I'm gonna call it A because there are gonna be a bunch of constants in this calculation. Um, I guess I could number them C one through six, but, but I'm gonna call it A. Then it's got this denominator, cinch X cosh squared X to the one quarter. and exp of minus two thirds, uh, actually two over three epsilon, cinch x to the three halves. All right. So let me put a box around that because that's sort of the behavior on, that's one outer solution. If you want to think of it in boundary layer terms, it's like something is happening near the turning point at X equals zero. We've got a solution on the right, we've got a solution on the left. We've just done the outer solution on the right. So. That's our solution on the right. Is there any question so far? Is the solution decaying very, very, very fastly? Very, very fast. Okay. Right, because we're doing exponential of a, of a negative number that is itself exponentially big. And it's got the one over epsilon in there as well. So yeah, this is really decaying quickly. This is what I mean about things that like tunneling is not something that is gonna you're not gonna see it too often in the macroscopic world. This is why you can't walk through a brick wall. Um, okay, but anyway, so now we, what, what we're especially interested in is as we start backing up towards the layer near the turning point, what's the behavior then? So how does this behave as X goes to zero? Because that's what we're gonna need that for matching. Well, um, 
Actually, maybe I'll move this up so I can still see what I'm doing. Okay, so think about what happens as X goes to zero from the positive side in this formula. So the things to remember is that, well, cinch of X is asymptotic to X. That's the lowest order term in the Maclaurin expansion. Cosh of X to lowest order is just asymptotic to one. And so this whole thing behaves like um, Y right will be asymptotic to A over X to the one quarter exponential of negative two over three epsilon X to the three halves. And I want you to pay attention to this combination, X to the three halves over epsilon. And that's an interesting combo that has arisen in this problem, that X and epsilon have this interplay between them, X to the three halves over epsilon. This turns out to be very typical near a turning point. We'll be doing other problems in this course that have turning points and you'll, you'll be seeing a lot of three halves and two thirds, you'll get used to them. I mean, it, you, that's something that happens in perturbation theory, just like I made the big deal about one quarter in the WKB away from turning points, the, the three halves type of behavior is very common near a turning point. And you just start to remember these exponents because they have a universal aspect to them. Okay, so anyway, that's just something to keep in mind. By the way, uh, don't you might be thinking to yourself, um, look at this expression here again, that x to the three halves over epsilon. I thought we were interested in x going to zero. Why don't I just do a Maclaurin expansion of the exponential for a small argument? Right, you could just write down a Maclaurin series for small argument exponential of something small, but that would be a bad idea because epsilon is also going to zero. So you don't, you have to think about this carefully and there's no, we're not sure that this whole argument is small. Um, so you don't wanna start expanding that for a small argument. I, I just leave it the way it is. I mean, obviously with epsilon fixed, then yes, it would be okay as X goes to zero, then you could do that. But um, we wanna think of both epsilon and X as small when we're in the layer. And so I don't wanna make a commitment yet. So yeah, don't simplify that any further. Okay, so that was the right side. Now let's deal with the left side. And again, since there's so much algebra in all this, I do wanna keep you oriented to what's going on. So let me just repeat, though I think you're probably with me, but like the game plan is we're staring at this picture right here. And what we have just done is we've calculated what's happening here on the right side. When I spoke about exponential decay, you see it's not exactly exponential because I have the I mean, it's an exponential of something decaying, but then there's an X to the three halves. So it's a little more complicated than just exponential of minus X, but, but that's, it, that's what I mean by exponential decay. So we've dealt with this part. Now we're gonna deal with this oscillatory part over here on the left, and then we're gonna merge them together in the, the layer in between in here. Okay, so let's go back to what's happening on the left, um, the left side. Well, all right. So now we have X less than zero. And so when I look at an expression like square root of Q of T, 
which was cinch of t cosh squared of t to the one half power. You have to keep in mind that t is now negative. And so you're taking cinch is an odd function. Cinch of a negative number is negative. So um, think of, I mean, in the integral, remember that t is going from zero to x. So it's like this. X is more negative than t. t runs from zero to some negative x when we do the integral of interest. And so um, when I write cinch of t to the half power, I have to be a little careful about that. You should think of it as, um, well, one way you could write it is negative one times negative of cinch of t. Since t is negative, cinch of t is negative, and the negative of that makes it positive. Right, this expression and here is positive. So this whole thing is gonna be plus or minus i times the square root of cinch of absolute value of t. And so when I write the integral from zero to x, of square root of q of t dt. This is the integral from zero to x, but remember x is less than zero. So the, the integral is written sort of weirdly with the upper limit being actually less than the lower limit. Um, plus or minus i square root of Cinch absolute t cosh t dt. Um, you just have to think about it for a minute and it, it's really not that bad. It still gives us sort of what you would expect, plus or minus two thirds. It looks very much like the other expression that we had, plus or minus two thirds, but now with an i out front cinch of this quantity negative x, which is then a positive quantity, all raised to the three halves power, keeping in mind that x is negative. Um, so this is something pure imaginary. And so when I take the exponential of that, as I do in the WKB method, the exponential of plus or minus one over epsilon integral from zero to x square root q of t dt. Um, this will give sines and cosines. Since I'm taking an exponential of an imaginary argument. Okay, so let me now write down what I get. We're getting then uh, y left <clears throat> of x is according to w, k, and b, one over cinch absolute x cosh squared x all to the one quarter power times some big thing. So some arbitrary constant B cosine of this argument that I just cranked out by doing the integral. So cosine of two cinch to the three halves power of x. Well, let me call it absolute value of x. That's all over three epsilon. Plus or 
plus C times the sine function of the same argument. Hmm. How's it going? You hanging in there? <laughs> I mean, okay, let's see, let's stare at this. Um, what's it saying? I've got, maybe I'll put a box around it so we can catch our breath. Right, so that's my, my um, WKB on the left side. It's telling me that I've got, notice this expression is decaying as X gets towards negative infinity, right? This is some big thing here in the denominator. Then I take it to the one quarter power, which makes it more mild, but still, um, this, is, this is a decaying amplitude on top of something that's oscillatory because it's cosine and sine of some rapidly changing argument. So we'd expect some kind of decaying oscillation going out there at negative infinity. And that's, that's similar to what we drew by common sense in this picture, decaying oscillation. Okay, so what now? Well, now I wanna take this and let it go towards the turning point, X going to zero and see how it behaves. All right, so let's do that as X goes to zero, but now from the negative sign, negative side, um, Y left behaves like, again, cinch and cosh are just going, you know, cinch goes, behaves like X. So I end up getting one over magnitude of X to the one quarter for the amplitude part. And which is interesting actually, because the sines and cosines are bounded. All right, those are bounded terms. Whereas this term is bl actually blowing up as X goes to zero. It's blowing up like one over X to the one quarter power. It's kind of interesting. So this is predicting a large amplitude. It's not gonna get very close to X equals zero. There's gonna be an inner region that will accommodate this blow up. It's not really gonna blow up. But if you just took this series, just literally, it looks like it's about to blow up. Um, anyway, then times what's going on inside here that stuff is behaving like B cosine of two over three epsilon. The cinch of X behaves like X. So this is like absolute X to the three halves. And then there's a similar term with sine. Okay, good. So it's interesting actually, notice again, we're seeing that same X to the three halves over epsilon. That is the natural argument of our function. Appearing, you know, in there, just like it did on the right side. Okay, so there we are. Now, um, time to do some matching. So let's look at the inner layer. Okay, well, obviously, we need this for matching. The, the left and right sides. 
And so how to deal with it. All right, well, we know how to do inner layers. We go something like this. We're gonna say big X equals Delta. Wait, did I do, I've done that backwards. Take that back. Let me try that again. Big X is defined as little X over Delta, right? That's what we usually do. And we're gonna choose the Delta by dominant balance. where the thinking is that delta is some function of epsilon and it's going to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Um, by the way, I don't need to scale the y variable. And that's because the problem is linear in y. So if I put in any scaling, it would just cancel out anyway. So there's, there's no point scaling Y. Uh, since the ODE is linear. And Y. Um, but here we're thinking if we've done the correct scaling, big X should be order one in the layer. That's if, if delta has been chosen correctly. Okay, so let's stare at this. We've got epsilon squared y double prime, which now converts to epsilon squared y sub capital XX over delta squared. That's how the second derivative would be converted. Um, and then that's supposed to equal Q of X times Y, which in our problem is going to equal what? So we have to do cinch of X, cosh squared of X times Y. But now think about these, little x is delta times big X. So this is cinch of delta X, cosh squared of delta X times Y. And the way you should think of it is big X is order one. And um, the delta is going to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So you only need to take the leading order term for both cinch and cosh, right? I mean, we're close, we're near zero. So it's sufficient to approximate these asymptotically um, as this behaves like delta x plus order delta cubed. And this behaves like one plus order delta squared all times y. Um, and so putting it all together and just keeping the leading term behaves like delta x times y. plus the next correction term would be of order delta cubed. So if we now try to do our dominant balance argument, um, let's look at what we've got. So here's a, here's a term that's of order epsilon squared over delta squared. And there's only one other term, this one, delta. So the, the correct balance actually the only balance you could even entertain doing is to take epsilon squared over delta squared equal to delta. Right, take that 
in this. Um, which now you see where the three halves power is coming from. It's coming from this balance. Somehow the WKB is already anticipating what's going to be needed. That, that these balance when delta equals epsilon to the two thirds. Or putting it the other way, um, I guess epsilon is delta to the three halves, but that's not a really helpful way for us. This is the way that's good. That tells us the scaling of the interior layer. Okay, and so let's make that choice. And so with that choice, um, with that choice of delta, then our inner solution y satisfies y sub capital XX equals capital X times Y, right? All the constants cancel out and I'm neglecting the higher order terms. So, and, and that's it. I mean, that's the equation for what's happening in the inner region. And it's a very famous equation. This is called the Aries equation. So this is why Airy functions come out because Airy's equation is the generic equation that arises near a turning point. When you take everything to lowest order and focus on what's happening in the inner region, this is where Airy's equation comes from. I think Airy was an astronomer, if I remember right. George Airy, I think is the guy's name. He's a British guy. Um, I don't know the history. I sort of think as an astronomer, he might've been concerned with questions about optics and telescopes and maybe like things that lenses do wrong. Like I think he had to be very concerned about waves and optics and aberration or other peculiarities of lenses. I'm not sure if this is correct. I, I should get back to you on that. Um, I forgot to look this up. But anyway, so he may have encountered this in, in problems of optics, or it may have been water waves. I don't know. Maybe he was a fluid dynamicist. I, I honestly don't know much about Airy. Um, could quickly look him up. Maybe if, some, if one of you is spacing out while I'm writing, look him up on Wikipedia and, and interrupt and tell us what you find. Um, okay. So anyway, Airy's equation is typical in turning point problems. Actually, I could just jump out of this lecture for one second. Maybe I'll do that. I don't wanna, normally wouldn't do this, but I, I'm curious now. I love history of math. He's, he's an astronomer. He was um, an astronomer? Yeah, and I was in 1835. And Jane, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen so we can all see this together. Um, you guys went on to Wikipedia. Apparently there's so uh, two ways to search for him. <laughs> Sorry, what was that, um, Jackson? Apparently there's two other um, mathematical objects called the Airy function as well. Oh, well, we're gonna see one of them. Oh, there are? You mean not even in this context? Well, that's interesting. Yeah, well, one of them's optics related, that some point spread function for aberrations, like you said, but it, I think it's a distinct thing from the things oh. associated with this equation. Well, let's see now. It says this guy was an English mathematician and astronomer, seventh astronomer royal, worked on planetary orbits. That's not helping me. How do I know? Why? Wait, I want to know about airy functions. Maybe, oh, hey, this is interesting. Here he says something. It says something about the airy disk. The resolution of optical devices is limited by diffraction. Hmm. It says uh, airy patterns 
are concentric rings. Is that this thing that I just saw a picture of? Huh. The size of the airy disk depends on the light wavelength. Airy was the first to explain it theoretically. That sounds like someplace where airy functions might have come up. I don't know. I wonder if I quickly search for history of airy functions. Does that tell me anything? The airy function is named after astronomer and physicist Airy, who encountered it early in his early study of optics. All right. So you guys can read about this at your own time. But so there's some amusing history there. All right. Let me jump back into where I was meant to be. Okay, so um, area equation. Now, uh, I mean, you can see already that, by the way, that this. Um, if I, if I write out x in terms of this delta, x over delta would be x over epsilon to the two thirds. And that's giving us some insight into why, if you think of it this way, it's x to the three halves over epsilon, all to the two thirds power. You can see why this combination of x to the three halves over epsilon kept coming up. Okay, so we had indications of that. Now, at this point, um, this is where I started pre-writing the lecture. So let me see how close my guess was. I, I didn't know how many pages I would need. So I'm gonna delete this page and this page. Well, let me just jump ahead. I'll go to here. All right. So there's Aries equation. And um, it's a linear equation. People have studied the properties of its solution. So its general solution is a linear combination of two functions, which are called Airy functions. And I think it's kind of charming the way they're named, that the, the standard one that gets discussed a lot is written as AI, obviously in recognition of Aries' first two letters of his last name, AI, in Airy. So what should be the second Airy function, BI? <laughs> I don't know if you find that amusing, I do. So, okay, so we've got AI and BI as the Airy functions. Um, and the properties you could read about in Bender and Orsog. And so I'm not gonna derive them. We've talked about them a little earlier in the course. Like we had integral representations for the Airy functions. You might remember we some of our methods for, I don't know, stationary phase or steepest descent. That's why we did all that stuff in the first few weeks of the course, so that we could talk about the asymptotics of the airy functions or other special functions as x goes to plus or minus infinity, because that's what you need for matching, right? When you're in the inner layer, then to get out to where you have to match, you have to go out to infinity. So here, for matching, we're going to need the behavior asymptotically of the airy functions, that large argument. And those have already been tabulated. So in Bender and Orsog, they mention on page 570 that um, the airy function for large x, ai of x, behaves like uh, 1 over 2 square root of pi. Here's the 1 over x to the 1 fourth, which is interesting that that 1 quarter is just coming right out as it's gonna be needed to match up with what WKB is expecting. And then there's an exponential with this argument minus two thirds X to the three halves. So this is the decaying airy function. AI is the decaying one. That's the one we're gonna need. This other one, BI is exponentially growing. It has a plus sign here. We're not gonna be using that one. Then also as X goes to negative infinity, this is a bit more intricate, um, as X goes to negative infinity, it turns out that AI and BI behave like sine. AI is more sine-like, BI is more cosine-like, but they each have this phase shift of pi over four in them. We've seen pi over fours in other problems. I think, didn't a pi over four come up when we were doing Bessel's uh, equation? 
this kind of stuff comes up in these problems. There are deep reasons for it actually that I, I don't claim to understand, but I, I've seen people talking about something called the Maslow index and um, Barry's phase. And I think that there are topological reasons for this pi over four and pi over twos that sometimes come up. So I, I'm talking about stuff I don't know anything about here, but um, I'm pretty, sh I, I've put something in the um, Canvas page that you guys can look at, a handout about WKB and its relation to topological matters. So this would be for a next course. But um, I'll just mention here that there are connections. To this sophisticated topological thing called the Maslow index. Now I better put a question mark there because I, like I say, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I, I think there, you can look up that story if you want. Anyway, for our purposes, um, the important point is that we know the explicit behavior of these at large negative argument. Okay, now let's do the matching. So I've got a bunch of constants lying around. What, what are these alpha and beta? Remember I said my inner solution. So if I solve the inner problem, I'm gonna get a linear combination. I'll call those coefficients alpha and beta. And I have to choose the alpha and beta in such a way that they match up onto the right and left solutions that we already determined. So I wanna to try to solve for those. I also wanna solve for these constants, B and C, which arose, the B and the C arose here. Oh, well, there's a long <laughs> wilderness there. Um, where were B and C? B and C were these guys right here, B and C. They were coefficients of the oscillatory part on the left. There was a constant A way back here. There's an A, that's a constant on the right side. So keep track of the constants. What do we have? We have A, B, C, alpha and beta. But remember the structure of the whole problem. The whole problem is a linear homogeneous differential equation. Um, if I'm just interested in solving this differential equation, even after I do all the matching and all of that is done, I'm still gonna have one undetermined constant, A. I'm gonna choose A to be that one. And that's because of, you can always multiply a solution of an equation like this by a constant and it will still be a solution by linearity, right? A scalar multiple of a solution of a homogeneous linear equation is a solution. And so we would need that A to match this final boundary condition. So, so what I'm trying to get you prepared for is that everything is gonna be solved in terms of A. Okay, sorry to give you um, vertigo by scrolling too fast, but what can I do? All right, so we're gonna determine all of these um, in terms of A. Okay, so if I match uh, what's happening first to the right, well, so what is that? We're going out of the layer, so we go to positive infinity towards the right. Meanwhile, coming from the outside, we go towards x equals zero from the right. And so you just have to copy the formulas that we wrote down earlier. So I've saved us the time of doing that copying. Here they are. This is the inner solution with its alpha and beta in it. And I've used the large x asymptotics on the airy function to write all of this, right? This is the, this is the airy function, ai of x, and this is the airy function, bi of x, um, as x goes to, wait, did I do that wrong? Yeah, that's right. This is the AI. How can I tell? This one's exponentially decaying. This one's the BI. 
First of all, because it has a beta in front of it that goes with the B. But you can see this one's exponentially growing. It has a positive coefficient and it's exponential. Um, and that is all supposed to match with what's happening that we already determined on the left. This thing, which is exponentially decaying. So you can read off that, and it's no surprise, we don't have any bi. We have to kill that term because it's exponentially growing. And we have to match these coefficients. Um, right here, I have to look at this stuff. That term has to match this. And so that gives me this condition below. Actually, better be careful. I need to also include this negative one quarter power. Because now comes, you know, since I love these exponents, check this out. I've got two thirds multiplied by negative one quarter. That's two over 12, that's one sixth. So that's where this epsilon to the one sixth is occurring. You don't see too many one sixth powers in math um, class, but here's one of them. So, so there's alpha now in terms of A and epsilon to the one sixth. Then likewise, we do the matching um, on the left. So here, as we go to the left, we got to go out of the layer going leftward out to negative infinity. And coming from the outside, we go let x go to zero from the left. So to, uh, towards the negative sign, uh, x goes to zero minus. Then I write down my two expressions. Here's my, so what's going on with this? This is the oscillatory airy function, ai. You might wonder where's bi? Well, it's already been killed off. We already said in the previous argument that beta was zero. So it's zero for all time. I mean, it's zero now. It's, there is no bi in this problem. So we've killed off that term. And so we only have the airy ai function, which its asymptotics are shown right there. And it has to match up um, with what's happening in the inner region, which is this. Did I do that backwards? I think I've said it. No, wait. This is the stuff on the left. I'm sorry. This is the left. This is the inner region. Asymptotics, this, all of this. Now, okay, you may be wondering why do I have this little dashed line under this sine function? And it's because I have to deal with this phase shift term, this pi over four, because this, this expression was written without phase shifts. This was written as B cosine. Notice no phase shift plus C sine of the same argument as this. Again, no phase shift. Whereas this has this phase shift. So I'm going to go back to high school and use a trig identity, which is that the sine of you know, something plus pi over four is cosine of something, sine of pi over four, et cetera. So, so here's the cosine of pi over four, that's square root of two over two, and the sine of pi over four the square root of two over two. And now everything's good because this X dependence matches this X dependence and this one matches this. And so I can read off my coefficients of sine and cosine. And when you do that, you get what I've just written down here in the boxes. So it's interesting. Again, you see this epsilon to the one sixth popping up. I mean, you have to do the algebra. I realize I'm going fast, but there's nothing subtle about this. Do the algebra, you get B and C as shown. And if you compare all the expressions for A, B, and C, you end up getting this nice relationship that B and C are equal to each other. There they are, they're this expression. And when you compare them to A, they turn out to be square root of two times A. So let's now take stock of everything. When we put everything together, this is what we have. On the right, we have the exponentially decaying term times this amplitude. On the left, 
we have this oscillatory term, which I've written with its phase shift put back in, just because that's conventional to do it that way. And um, I've done a little bit more trigonometry behind the scenes, so don't expect to exactly follow this. You have to do a little work. But when you do that trig, it ends up causing two different square roots of two to multiply together to make a two here. So, so you end up getting a confusing factor of two. It took me a few minutes to understand this when I was reviewing my notes today, but it really is there. So there's a two there. Everything's proportional to A as expected. The whole solution is proportional to A. And um, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I've got these, these cinches here. I've got the airy function ruling its domain in the middle at the turning point. It's got this interesting scaling of epsilon to the negative one sixth on its amplitude. Remember I said that you sort of expect the whole thing to blow up in some way or, or look like it's threatening to blow up as you get close to zero, but, but there's a layer there of a certain thickness. And this, this airy function deals with what's happening very close to zero through this combination. Now, you'll recognize that I have these three different types of behavior, and usually we combine them to make a uniformly valid solution that applies everywhere. And you can do that here. Um, it's a bit of work, and I don't want to show you all the steps in that. So let me just refer you to Bender and Orsog, page 510 where they quote a famous result, Langer's formula. Langer was the first one in the 1930s to um, write down this composite solution. That is a, sort of complicated. I don't, I'm not gonna write it down here. But, but what I wanna finish with is um, just showing you what this looks like in a computer. So Bender and Orsog have computed it for us. And I'm just gonna copy from them. This is figure um, 1010 in their book with a few little annotations from me. So like I say, they were doing the problem. It says it down here in the caption. I can maybe blow it up if it, I don't know if this is legible for you. Um, they chose boundary conditions where the function goes through one and then decays to zero out at infinity, which this one does. They're showing you, of course, the money aspect of this picture is that the exact solution is this upper curve and the WKB Langer approximation, the, uni the uniformly valid one is this lower curve. And they're really good, even when epsilon is as big as 0.2. So it's, it's really working. We got the airy functions controlling things in here in this inner layer to sort of the scaling of the thickness is like epsilon to the two thirds power. For this value of epsilon, this number turns out to be about 0.3 or 0.4. So here's one on this scale. So 0.3 would be about in here. And so a few multiples of 0.3 is what we mean by the inner layer. And so I've tried to schematically show it here. And then also this number y, that, that number is predicted to be growing like epsilon to the negative one sixth. If you take this number and plug it in, it tells you that epsilon to the negative one sixth is 1 1.3, which again, if this is one, 1 1.3 would be about here. So it's in the right ballpark. I mean, we're not claiming it's an exact result. It's just a scaling. But anyway, um, I hope this impresses you. I mean, this is some pretty subtle behavior and it's all captured by this WKB approximation. And we only had to take one term. I mean, it's a really good, um, really good perturbative method for this kind of problem. All right, so I think I'll stop there unless um, you wanna ask any questions. I realize I've been barreling along. All right, well, there are homework problems about this for those of you who are doing the homework and um, you can enjoy it and, and try it out for yourself. Uh, actually, I would like a little bit of advice or help. If any of you can do a Mathematica solution of this problem, I would appreciate that. You know, can I tried to get it to do asymptotic D solve on this and it doesn't seem to know the WKB method. 
I couldn't get it to do an, I couldn't get it to reproduce what we just did today. So if you can get it to do symbolically what we did today, I would like to see that notebook. Or, um, I mean, without teaching it the WKB method, I want it to work out of the box, you know, off the shelf. The other thing is I didn't really see how to do a numerical solution using Mathematica either. I, I need to impose a boundary condition at zero and one out at positive infinity. And uh, when I asked it to do numerical solutions, I couldn't get it to work either. But I'm pretty inept at Mathematica, so I'm sure you can teach me how to do this. So, so let me know if you figure that out. Okay. All right. That's it. I'll see you next time.